By now, you've seen them. Skies turned orange and red as thick smoke blocks out the sun. But the winter blast has now left millions with unprecedented storm damage. It is just terrifying, really, how absolutely endless the line of fire is. The debate is over. Climate change is real. It is already causing major problems. And if we do not act boldly and decisively, a bad situation will become worse. In order to address climate change, there are five grand challenges that we will need to tackle. Electricity, of course, manufacturing, transportation, buildings, and agriculture. And agriculture is essential because without food, there is no chance at maintaining a thriving, sustainable society. But as we think about the role agriculture plays in climate change, one lesser known contributor is eutrophication. Allow me to explain. This video was created in partnership with Bill Gates, inspired by his new book, How to Avoid a Climate Disaster. You can find out more about how we can all work together to avoid a climate disaster in the link below. The idea of summer is something most people think of as a fun and exciting time of year. The temperatures are enjoyable, vitamin D is in high supply, and we get to break out our favorite pair of denim shorts. But while humans are flocking to the beaches to spend time in our beloved oceans, the creatures that depend on those same waters are having an entirely different experience. Every year, May through September, there is a phenomenon that takes place where many of our rivers meet the ocean. More specifically, this phenomenon is most notably problematic in the Gulf of Mexico. Where algae dies, the water is depleted of oxygen, and fish can no longer live. This phenomenon is called eutrophication, better known as a dead zone. Now I know the name dead zone sounds scary, and to be honest, it is, but I've tried to explain this to people in the past, and when I say dead zone, they say, do you mean areas where there's no cell service? So let me explain what exactly is actually going on here. These areas are depleted of oxygen, which is quantified by having less than two milligrams per liter of oxygen. But where does the oxygen go? Well, according to the National Oceanic Atmospheric Administration, excess nutrients that run off of land or are piped as wastewater into rivers and coasts can stimulate an overgrowth of algae, stick with me, <laughs> which then sinks and decomposes in the water. And the decomposition process consumes so much oxygen that it depletes the supply available to healthy marine life. According to one of the top researchers on this topic, someone I would love to study under if I ever go back to school to get my PhD, the size of the dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico is about 8,000 square miles wide. That's about the size of the state of New Jersey. Poorly located or managed animal feeding operations overgrazing, plowing too often, excess use of pesticides and irrigation water. These are all things that lead to these nutrients making their way into the Mississippi and hence into the Gulf. This is very difficult to regulate because the Mississippi watershed encompasses 1.2 million square miles, which equals about 40% of the United States. And all that land is home to hundreds of thousands of farmers. There are 35,000 in Mississippi alone. The nutrients these farmers are using to grow crops are not new. They're not something that the soil doesn't already have. Our soils have always had these materials, these nutrients, but because of bad farming practices over time, the soil have lost these nutrients, so they have to add them back. The two main nutrients that we are seeing add to these dead zones in the Gulf are nitrogen and phosphorus. Nitrogen gives the plant the ability to store energy from photosynthesis, so obviously important. And phosphorus helps promote root growth and plant strength also really important. But the food that the bulk of these nutrients are going to are corn and soy, most of which is used to feed animals like hogs, cows, and chickens, not directly to humans. And of course, those animals, when they relieve themselves, excrete those nutrients, which exacerbates this issue. In fact, 200 cows produce as much nitrogen as in the sewage from a community of five to 10,000 people. 
and a 2010 agricultural census found that cattle, pigs, and poultry livestock produce about 120 million tons of manure per year, most of which is containing, you guessed it, excess nitrogen and phosphorus. So how is this dead zone impacting the Gulf? What are the impacts that people are feeling from this, as well as the ecosystems that depend on that water to not be completely void of oxygen? How is it impacting them? With the dead zone covering 8,000 square miles, you can imagine this has an intense impact on the local fisheries, ergo the local economy, as well as the fish themselves, which we'll get to. But according to NOAA, the dead zone costs US seafood and tourism industries $82 million a year. And how does this impact climate change? Well, the greening and eutrophication of the world's lakes and oceans will increase the emissions of methane into the atmosphere by 30 to 90% during the next 100 years. Methane is a much more powerful warming gas than carbon dioxide is. And how is this going to affect our natural ecosystems? Well, let's hear from the expert herself, Dr. Nancy Robales. As a scientist, I have access to high-tech equipment that we can put over the side of the research vessel. And it measures oxygen and many more things. And you can tell by the, the bottom oxygen you can draw a map of everything that's less than two, which is the magic number for when the fish start to leave the area. I also dive in this dead zone. Down at 30 feet, you start to see fewer fish, and then you get to the bottom and you don't see any fish. There's no life on the platform. There's no life swimming around. And you know you're in the dead zone. Now that we understand how this dead zone is going to not only impact local populations and their way of living, but as well as exacerbate climate change and have a huge impact on our natural ecosystems, climate change also makes the issue of eutrophication worse. As climate change progresses and our weather patterns continue to change, the farmers have to adjust their farming practices, leading to higher water use and more nutrient runoff. Warmer temperatures and increased runoff of fresh water will increase stratification of the water column, thus further promoting the formation of dead zones. Warmer water holds less oxygen than cool water, thus making it easier for dead zones to form and warmer waters will increase metabolism of marine creatures, thereby increasing their need for oxygen. And this is just a small part of the puzzle, but tackling this will help us play an important role in solving climate change by the year 2050. At this point, we've run into a little bit of a which came first, the chicken or the egg problem. Because if you're understanding what we're going over, we hear that eutrophication is going to be made worse by climate change because the warmer the water is, the less oxygen it holds, so the bigger the dead zone gets. We also learned that because eutrophication emits methane, it makes climate change worse because methane is a much more powerful greenhouse gas than even carbon dioxide. So you can see that we need to tackle this issue in order to help our marine ecosystems, but also to help ourselves in terms of reducing and putting a stop to climate change. So I can't leave you off with all of the doom and gloom of this video without some solutions. And I talked to an amazing farmer out of Iowa who gave us some great insight and even some wonderful solutions. Mr. Song, can you, can you hear me? Yes. Hi. <laughs> Good morning. Some of the most well-known and most impactful solutions start in the Midwest on our farms. So Mr. Sloan implements quite a few different things on his farm to stop nutrient runoff, one of the most impactful being a no-till practice. But what I was really interested in learning from Mr. Sloan is if all of those practices he has implemented have benefited his farm and or if they were incentivized or required by the government or if they were all done on his own free will. Mostly on um, my experience is their own free will and, and just protecting the soil and wanting to pass it on in, in better shape or as good a shape as it was when we got it. So if you keep your soil loss commonly below five ton an acre, which is the thickness of a dime, then the soil scientists tell us that the substrates mineralize at a rate where it would be sustainable to keep farming that way. I've gotten my soil loss down to where it's more like a half ton an acre. If 40 years time you have a stack of dimes 
40, 40 dimes stacked up, you could imagine we'd lose quite a bit of soil. So I've, I've had a higher uh, standard for myself to, yeah. to achieve. Obviously the solution to, to helping dead zones is to decrease nutrient runoff. And right now there's not, as far as I'm aware, a lot of legislation to make farmers implement those measures. Do you think it's better to leave it that way, that we have a slow transition, or is it better to have government involvement from, from your perspective as someone who does those things? Yeah, I think that we want the government to be a partner. It's some of these tools that are there, it takes time to use them. And so having the government be a partner in that, um, it also took like some changes of equipment and learning a new technique these things do work. They will make a difference if, if more people choose to adopt them. Yeah, I'm really interested in, in what is the best balance of hoping farmers implement these practices because they benefit everybody, including themselves, and having the government use data to come up with some sort of uh, system to implement. It's, it seems like it's a really hard problem to solve, although obviously some of you guys have figured it out, <laughs> like you have. If you, as a consumer, are able to uh, encourage companies that you buy products from to be more sustainable, we can are able to develop carbon markets and things like that. Then, that then there will be money flowing back. It wouldn't necessarily just be through a governmental type of a regulatory system. Our companies that are going to be selling us these products, they encourage sustainability then they are looking to buy grains that are grown sustainably. I think that's yeah. a good thing. And so that's really interesting that you say that. Do you see companies requesting that or have you have you heard that that's in higher demand? Have you seen that shift over the last few years? Yes, uh, I know there's some companies in Cedar Rapids being where a lot of our grain goes for processing and I don't have to name them specifically, but but yeah, they, they definitely have programs where They'll pay a little more for the soybeans if they're grown according to some standards. Actually, a really interesting caveat there would be if there is some sort of like a labeling. You know how like if something is fair trade, there's a label on it. If something was sustainably grown, supporting XYZ sustainable farming practices, if more things maybe had a label like that or if a label was created for something like that. That's great. You know, so that people would make it easier for a consumer walking down an aisle to decide between products if they know that one's more sustainably raised. I wanted to ask Mr. Sloan those questions because I wanted to get a farmer's perspective on government intervention. If he thought that was the most impactful way to make a change from what he has seen in the way that the market responds to his sustainably grown grains. And while I definitely think that individuals and consumer demand can play a big role in changing the market towards more sustainable agriculture, there are a few other ways that we can go about it. And I think a combination of all of these would be best. Obviously, we have to talk policy. Similar to the policy they used to solve the issue in the Chesapeake Bay with permitting and coalitions, total maximum daily loads, and watershed implementation plans, there are methods to use policy to reduce our nutrient output. The plan that they implemented with the Chesapeake Bay did work. Their dead zone has shrunk since implementing the previously mentioned solutions. The problem is that the Chesapeake Bay watershed is quite literally half the size of the Mississippi watershed and the states that formed a coalition to help the Chesapeake Bay were a little bit different than the ones you would have to get to create and form a coalition to solve the issue in the Gulf of Mexico. Policy alone likely wouldn't be enacted fast enough to make a real change in the short amount of time that we have to solve the climate crisis. We can also implement infrastructure. A great example of this would be buffer zones. These are zones between farmland and the Mississippi River to help catch nutrients before it makes it into the Mississippi and all the way down to the Gulf. We can also implement different types of water treatment. There are several different ways to go about this, but that is another form of infrastructure that can help reduce this nutrient flow. We could also take Mr. Sloan's advice and do more individual actions to create a demand in the market to tell farmers we want to see more sustainable farming practices. Other things we could do is create a market to understand a nitrogen 
footprint. This falls under something I'm always talking about, but every single thing we buy has a resource footprint. If we made it more obvious how many resources go into everything we make and the impacts of those resources, perhaps and hopefully more people would care. I know you and me do. Other things you can do as an individual is ask your representatives to support and introduce legislation for the above policies, farming practices, and infrastructure. And asking brands specifically, writing them emails, tweeting at them, and actually physically writing them letters to let them know that you want to see transparency and improvement in their supply chain to work with farmers who are using better conservation and sustainable farming practices to help solve climate change and reduce eutrophication, not just in the Gulf of Mexico, but all across the world. I am so hoping that you learned something new with this video today. It is an issue that I am so, so passionate about because I think it's such an obvious example of how humans have had an impact on climate change, on our natural ecosystems, and on ourselves. Our own bad practices are leading to the detriment of some other people's income, and I think it's just the perfect illustration of how we're all connected and how our actions make a real difference. And don't forget, this video was actually created in partnership with Bill Gates. It is inspired by his new book, How to Avoid a Climate Disaster, and you can find out more about how we can all work together to avoid a climate disaster in the link below. I really, really hope you liked this video. Thank you so much for watching. Please share this because you can imagine it took me quite a while to put together. And don't forget, until next time, you cannot do all the good that the world needs, but the world needs all the good that you can do. Bye guys.